morning. Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to see uh, some of you and see some names for everyone else. We're so happy to have you. And like Nicole said, um, feel free to eat your lunch if you need to. Um, I just finished mine one minute before I popped on. So uh, feel free to do that if you need to. Um, so we're going to kind of um, just go through a little bit of uh, preliminary information about the program. I'm just going to sort of give a, a short um, introduction to the Pitt PA program, sort of what the curriculum is like, how the year runs, and things like that. I'd also like to give a big shout out to a bunch of my students who are on the call. I see a whole bunch of you popping up, so thank you. Hi, everybody, um, and thank you all for taking time out of your day to do this for us. We appreciate it. Uh, I think sometimes the students are, are even more beneficial than I am to answer your questions because they are much closer to where you will be than I am. So their perspective, I think, is, is really important. So a couple of housekeeping things just before I get started here. Um, I know Nicole said she's going to help to monitor the chat, so that's great. And if um, she can do that, that'd be really helpful. I think it's nice to hear from people, though. So if you have a question that you don't... Um, that you feel you are okay to say out loud. If you want to go ahead and uh, use the raise hand feature, um, I'll be sure to uh, keep an eye on that. And my uh, program administrator, Aileen Brasacchio, is also on the call, so she's going to help to just keep uh, keep me on track with that as well. And so, if you um, if you don't feel comfortable speaking out, or if you'd prefer not to do that, then feel free to go ahead and pop those questions in the chat. And like I said, hopefully Nicole can help me to monitor those. But again, if you can use the raise hand feature. Um, if you want to ask a question, I think that'll go a little bit more seamlessly than people sort of trying to talk over each other, which I'm sure everybody's used to with the uh, the Zoom Microsoft Teams type uh, life we all live now, right? Where uh, you know it's it's kind of hard to manage everybody, especially when I can only see a third of the screens right now. <laughs> so so I will do my best with that. Um, and if I, for some reason, don't see you or, or miss it or something like that, please, uh, please bear with us. We will do our absolute best to get everybody's questions answered. So I'll just go ahead and get started a little bit here with um, just a little bit of background about the information. Um, I didn't prepare any formal slides or anything because I think at this point it's like death by PowerPoint for a lot of people. And so I thought I would just kind of chat, chat with you all. And as I'm speaking, if something comes up that you really want to ask a question about, I have no problem, you know, stopping where I am. So, you know, feel free to go ahead and do that. Um, so again, I am the program director of the Pitt PA program. We are a 24 month master's program at the University of Pittsburgh. We are housed in the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Um, we have been a program for just coming up on 11 years. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, we, we had hoped to have our big 10 year anniversary. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic put a little bit of a, a wrench in that for us. So, um, you know, maybe we'll have a big celebration for 11, we'll see. Um, but I have been with the program since its inception. So I can say that I could probably speak to just about anything you have to ask about it since I've been here um, since the very beginning. I started my career at um, as the clinical coordinator for the program. So I worked very um, heavily on the clinical rotations that second year of the program as my um, first role. And then I um, also had some didactic teaching responsibilities as well. Um, after that, I did move to director of clinical education and then finally to program director. And that's where I am now. So we are, like I said, a 24 month program. The first 12 months um, is the didactic component of the program. And so that is going to be where you have your, um, all your classes, your lectures, all of your laboratories, your history and physical exam lab, your anatomy lab, um, your um, diagnostics procedures lab, all of those types of things um, for that first year. Um, that second year then is uh, all entirely clinical. And so you'll be out on clinical rotations for that second 12 months. Um, the first 12 months of the program, that didactic um, component, it is um, based on the uh, university calendar, um, the academic calendar, we do follow that. But I will say that something that's a little bit unusual uh, about us is we are a January start. So if um, you haven't come across that in some of your research about the program, that's something to keep in mind uh, because that is a little bit different. So we are a January start. We typically start that sort of first Monday in, um, in January, depending on where the university calendar falls. And then you will go straight through both years. So it is a, a summer attendance as well. And it's a full-time commitment in the summer as well. So um, our program is um, sequential. So you do have to go through it um, uh, spring, summer, fall, spring, summer, fall. And um, 
the clinical year is a little different because you are out on four week rotations in a variety of medical specialties. So you don't necessarily follow the academic calendar, you follow your clinical year calendar. Now, there certainly are still breaks and things like that built into the um, calendar for that clinical year, but it does not necessarily follow the university scheduled breaks. So I do always like to tell everyone that. And again, that um, clinical year is uh, basically full time, you know, spring, summer, fall semester. Um, so there's no, um, um, you know, part time options or anything like that for our program. Um, currently, all the faculty um, at the PA program do work full time, or I'm sorry, do still work clinically as well. And so I, I like to always highlight that because I think it holds a lot of value with the students to see that we are um, still actively involved in patient care, which is really, you know, what we all started out our careers as, right? We didn't go into education, we went into uh, physician assistant practice. And so we all still work clinically. Um, I myself currently work in addiction medicine one day a week for a, um, a national company, actually a, a large um, company um, that treats um, patients with alcohol abuse disorder, um, uh, opioid use disorder, and those kinds of things. So that's all um, what I uh, am currently working in. Now, uh, another quick thing I like to say, which kind of highlights my favorite part about the um, PA profession, is that I did not start in addiction medicine, and I certainly did not start um, in academics. My first career was um, in neurosurgery, and then I worked in interventional radiology, and then I worked in pulmonary and sleep medicine, and now I work in addiction medicine. And the reason I say that is because I think it, it highlights the flexibility and the movement within the PA profession, which I think is what uh, a lot of people are drawn to, is that you can you know, switch specialties, switch disciplines, you can work in multiple specialties, you can work in you know, maybe you work in a family medicine clinic and you uh, moonlight in the uh, ER or something like that. And so there's just a lot of options out there for PAs. And so I really think that that's a, a really big draw for people who are looking for a profession with a lot of movement. You don't necessarily have to go back to school for any of those. PA education, um, while we provide you all a very general um, medical curriculum education that is approved by our medical director, there's a lot of on the job training that will happen depending on what specialty you end up working in after your um, schooling is finished. So in saying that, um, because we are a January start, we graduate in December. So that's another thing to just keep in mind as well. Um, so as far as the curriculum, like I said, we talked about the didactic here, and that is where you're going to get a lot of your basic sciences in that first semester. So anatomy, uh, physiology, pathophysiology, um, and then you have an introductory course into the profession. You also have an introductory course into clinical medicine, which is really the sort of bread and butter of what you're going to learn as a PA, right? You're going to learn how to diagnose patients, you're going to learn how to treat them, and you're going to learn a lot of the different uh, modalities that go along with that. In your summer and fall semester, it's kind of a lot of part ones and part twos of courses. And so summer semester starts, um, uh, continues the clinical medicine course, uh, but also includes your history and physical exam course, which is going to be where you learn how to interview your patients as well as perform your physical exam. You'll have your diagnostics and procedures course, which is where you're going to learn about, you know, ordering all different studies for your patients. So maybe you need to order a complete blood count or something like that. You'll learn not only what that is, but how to interpret that in order to provide effective care to your patients. Um, you'll have pharmacology um, one and two. So you'll learn um, about all the different medications and safe prescribing and all of those kinds of things. So that will be um, part one and part two in the summer and the fall. And then we also have a couple of other courses uh, sort of scattered in there. You'll have a specific course on patient education and counseling, which is something that is really, really important to PAs and has always been a very strong suit of physician assistance is how well we educate our patients that we're able to take a little bit of extra time with our patients to really make sure that they understand what's, what's going on with their healthcare. We also have a fundamentals of surgery course. Um, that is really to prepare you um, to go into any surgical subspecialty that you might choose. Um, surgical subspecialties are actually a really big draw for PAs as well. So you'll see PAs working in, you know, everything from orthopedic surgery to, um, you know, trauma surgery. So there's a whole bunch of PAs that get um, pulled in that direction. So we do have that course. Um, you'll also have a health policy course to learn about all of the different governmental affairs and things like that that affect physician assistants. And you'll also have a course which um, is entitled Health Issues Across the Lifespan, which is 
where you learn how to treat a patient who is an infant very differently than you would treat a patient who is in uh, the geriatric category, right? You're gonna look at those patients very differently. And so we try to focus in on that, how a pediatric patient is different from an adult patient is different from a geriatric patient. And so that's kind of a, a brief synopsis of the um, didactic year. And then that clinical year, like I said, you'll have nine rotations and you'll do them in nine different areas of medicine. Two of them are going to be electives for you where you get to pick any um, medical specialty that you'd like. And to the best of our ability, we try to make that happen for students. It doesn't always line up perfectly, but we certainly do our best with that. The other ones you are going to be doing what we call our core rotations. So every student that goes through the curriculum completes an outpatient medicine, inpatient medicine, emergency department, behavioral medicine, um, OBGYN and women's health, um, pediatrics, and oh my gosh, I'm missing one, general surgery, excuse me, uh, surgery rotation. And so you will um, complete all of those as a PA student and then also still have those uh, additional electives to choose You know where you might want to enhance your learning for that as well. And so that is kind of an overview of the curriculum and a little bit about my uh, sort of background and, and some of the highlights I think about the PA profession itself. Um, we are located on uh, campus at Pitt now. Um, that's a pretty recent thing for us. We had previously been housed at a different location, a, a about 20 minute drive from Oakland, but we have moved down into a brand new space um, that we were there for about, I don't know, six months before the pandemic happened. And so we were very happy to be there and it's an absolutely lovely space and we're all looking forward to getting back there soon. Um, but it is not very far from Forbes Tower where a lot of the other um, SHRS programs are housed. And the reason I say that is because it has really given us um, a way to be able to collaborate more with the programs that are housed within our school. And so we um, have a strong feeling about interdisciplinary and interprofessional education. And we like to have our students be able to do that. So if we're able to link you up with some of the other programs within SHRS, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, audiology, and I could just go on and on, you know, we want to be able to do that because, um, you know, healthcare really should be a team-based effort. And so the more exposure and experience you have with other healthcare disciplines, I think it can only benefit you as you get out into your career because you'll have a better understanding of what they do. Um, and so we, we are able to do that a lot easier. Additionally, um, being in Oakland, um, if any of you are from here or have ever visited, you know that there are quite a few hospitals right, right in that area. And so that's been really nice as well for our students to be able to sort of be right in the hub of all of that that, that is going on. And um, for instance, during the didactic year, our students um, actually have a module for radiology that actually occurs with the radiology residents at UPMC Presbyterian. And so you actually go over there and you're taught by those, um, those uh, physicians, which is really nice. And so being able to be centrally located like that has really benefited our program to be able to um, kind of enhance the, the students learning experience and really get them more involved within not only the health system, but um, within the university itself as well. Um, let's see, I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. I think that's about it. Um, I will talk a little bit about admissions here. And then, like I said, I'll go ahead and, um, you know, kind of open it up to questions. Um, so as far as admission requirements and things like that for the program, because we are a January start, we have a very short cycle to um, actually accept applicants. And so for those of you are, that are considering applying this, um, this cycle this year, um, the CASPA, which is our central um, application database that we use for the physician assistant programs, that um, typically opens um, late April, and um, it's usually around the 23rd, 24th, 25th, and I apologize, I don't have that date um, right offhand, but I bet Aileen probably does, and she can maybe pop it into the chat for me. Um, and so my best advice to you is that if you are thinking about applying, because we really only accept applications from April of this year to November of this year, we interview throughout the summer and the fall, uh, typically July, August, September, October, November. Thank you, Aileen. So April 29th um, is CASPA this year. They change it by a couple of days every year and I just can never remember. Um, that my best advice to you is to be able to hit that submit button on your application as soon as possible. We have a rolling admission cycle, and so our class tends to fill very quickly. We get an enormous amount of qualified applicants. Um, they are, you know, top of the line 
absolutely fantastic people. I wish we could take everybody, um, but we only have our 60 slots for each, um, each cohort. And so I would advise you to be able to hit that submit button as soon as you can. Um, in saying that, sometimes we'll get questions from people, well, what if I have a class that's still in progress and it won't be over until, you know, May or something like that? That's okay. If you have some things that are still in progress, you can still enter them into the system and it will just show up as in progress. And then you would just update us, you know, as you, um, as you finish those courses. Or if you are still working through the summer to be able to finish your patient care hours, you can certainly still submit your application. You can still be interviewed. Um, and then we would just not be able to grant your uh, formal seat without, you know, having those completed. Um, in saying that about the complete all program requirements for admission must be completed by August 31st of, of this year. And so you do have basically the entire summer to kind of finish anything you might need to. Maybe if you need to take one other course or something like that, you're able to do that over the summer. Um, and so keep that in mind. So really important things. April 10th, 29th, CASPA opens be able to hit that submit button and, and, and make it happen, right? You're allowed to have a couple of things sort of out there looming if you still need to finish a couple of things. Um, but everything does have to be completed by August 31st. And then interviews take place. Um, like I said, we usually have two interview days in July, uh, one in October, and then one in November. Um, and I saw somebody ask that. So hopefully somebody, um, we actually just uh, finished um, our interview dates for the year. So those will probably pop up on the website by maybe late today or early tomorrow when they are. Um, my best guess is that the first one is going to be probably July 6th, um, I, I believe is what the, the faculty are planning on. Um, we are just waiting for a couple of more confirmations on that. So, um, and again, it is rolling admission. And so we um, typically interview about 36 people in a day. And so if you're interviewing 36 really wonderful um, candidates, you know, you might fill a good portion of that, that, that cohort um, for 60. And so that's something you just want to keep in mind. And again, being able to hit that submit button and get your application in and get that application reviewed so that you can interview on that, that first day, you know, that, that's really, really, really going to work in your, um, in your favor. Um, let's see. Um, admissions. Okay, so requirements. So, so we uh, talked a little bit about dates and things like that. As you'll see on our website, um, all of the requirements are, are up there. Um, all of the coursework, it's very science-based, right? So it's going to be very similar to a medical school requirement or something like that. You have your chemistries and biologies and um, your anatomy and physiology. And um, so we want to make sure that everybody pays attention to those. We look at your overall GPA, but we also look at your science GPA. And those are marked with an asterisk on our website. So you'll see that we actually calculate a second GPA for you based on just those science courses. And so you want to make sure that um, you know, you're paying attention to those. We uh, do not have a problem if you want to take a course again, or if you've taken a course twice, we will always take the highest grade. Okay, so maybe you took, you know, bio one as a first year student and didn't do great and got a C um, and, you know, maybe took it again as a, a in another year and ended up getting an A, we will default to that A for you. That, that's no problem at all. Um, we also accept AP courses credits. So if you um, had taken any of those, uh, maybe during your high school career or anything like that, um, those are counted as well. You do just want to remember that some of those things don't always translate to into the GPA that's calculated. Um, and so you just wanna keep that in mind about how that, that works for you. Um, a couple of other requirements that we do have is um, CASPA requires the personal statement. We are also requiring a, another app, um, admission essay. There will be a supplemental uh, essay to our application and that will be posted on the website as well. Um, and that sort of, there's a, a prompt for it that sort of surrounds how you will fit into the University of Pittsburgh's PA program's mission and how you'll help us to you know, achieve that mission and, and moving forward. Um, so keep your eye out for that as well. We also require CPR. You have to have BLS, Basic Life Support um, Certification, and it must be through AHA. It must be through the American Heart Association. So just make sure that you, um, you keep up with that. Um, so just 
just all of those things. In addition, um, there are a lot of other requirements that the program will require after you're um, matriculated. So background checks and um, you know immunization records and all of those kinds of things as well. Um, drug screening, that kind of thing. And so we do require all of those for matriculation. So you know you have a little bit of time to think about that, but you just want to make sure that you um, keep that, that in mind as well. So if any of you are completing patient care experience right now, I'm sure that you probably already know that um, and you've already had to do a lot of those things if you're working uh, in healthcare because they're usually pretty pretty across the board with a lot of that stuff. Um, but again, it is all um, on there. Um, we do not require shadowing currently, but we certainly highly recommend it if you're able to do that. And I know that's been a lot harder for people to do recently because of uh, the pandemic and not being able to get into things. I have noticed that there's some health systems um, out there that have been offering virtual shadowing opportunities for students. And so we certainly would accept any of those as well. That's no problem at all. Um, if you have any question about what might count for patient care experience or anything like that, um, you know, feel free to email the program at any time. We have a, um, a, an email address that you can send those types of questions to regarding the uh, admission requirements, because I certainly wouldn't want anybody to, you know, kind of complete 500 hours of something only to find out that it wasn't necessarily able to be accepted. Now, speaking in about all that, of course, I'm, I'm Pitt and I'm hail to Pitt and that's what we're here for. Um, but I do want you to know that if you are looking into other PA programs, which I would always advise you to do, I would never tell an applicant to, you know, apply to one school. Uh, PA programs are, are highly competitive. Um, we get between 800 and 1000 applications for our 60 slots. Um, so you can imagine most PA programs are probably dealing with a similar, a similar number. Um, but the one thing is I would say is that, you know, you want to apply to as many schools that you feel comfortable with, um, but always make sure that while a lot of requirements are very similar for PA programs, they're not always the same. And so you want to really make sure that you're digging into those websites and making sure, okay, this program requires two chemistries, but this program only requires one, or this program requires 500 hours, and this program requires a thousand. And so you just want to be very careful about that so that you're um, able to apply to multiple schools and, and cover all of their requirements to the best of your ability. Um, so I think that's about it for my, my lengthy little uh, spiel I had there. Um, so I will go ahead and sort of open it up to questions. Um, I know there's been a whole bunch in the chat. I don't know if I wanna maybe check in with uh, Aileen or Nicole. Is there anything that you need me to address from the chat or have you both been able to kind of answer that? And then, like I said, if anyone wants to raise a hand or um, you know try to ask a question out loud, I'm happy to do that. Or um, like I said, I'm sure any of the students that are on the call, if they can better answer it, I will certainly pass the pass the mic over to them. So, um, Robert. Um, hey, Emily, this is Aileen. Oh, okay. I'm answering everything in the chat right now and I'll let you know if there's anything I can't answer. Awesome, thanks, Aileen. Go ahead, Robert, with your question. Uh, so <clears throat> I've been out of like my undergrad program for Oh, it's almost been 10 years. Is there a limit or an exp expiration on prerequisite courses? I didn't see it on the website. All right, that's a good question. I just forgot to take myself off mute. Um, <laughs> no, at this point, we do not. Um, some people, if they have are coming back for sort of a second career educational experience, will say, you know, it's just been so long, I might want to take this class again, just as a refresher. Um, and certainly that's your choice. But we do not um, currently have any limit on when you needed to take your course. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. All right, um, I was just scrolling quickly through the list just to see if I had any other hands here and I don't see any. Um, I, and I'm gonna scroll through my screens here and make sure I'm not missing anybody. Okay. Um, any other questions that I can answer for anyone or? Oh, there's one, um, Karen. Karen Hi. Yang, go ahead. Yep. So all the applicants are so qualified. What makes an application stand out? That's a really good question. Um, and it, uh, as chair of the admissions committee, I have to admit it, it is incredibly difficult to, uh, to do this. 
Um, so certainly, I think that you know using that that personal statement in your application, as well as this um, sort of new supplemental essay that we're going to be adding this year, I think those are really the pieces that can help to make you stand out as a candidate, because that's really where you're able to tell your story, and that's where you're really able to highlight you and take it beyond a GPA number or beyond a course grade or beyond, you know, what you, um, the number of hours that you did in patient care. And so really use those to your benefit and cater them to the school that you're applying to. Um, much like you would write a cover letter for a job, you want to not send out, you know, this kind of generic statement to every school. If you're really trying to get into a, to a particular program, you want to do a little research about that program and you want to be able to talk about why why that program is the best fit for you. You know, what is it about this program's mission or vision or goals or things like that that really would would fit you and make the best educational experience for you. Um, additionally, a, a variety of patient care experiences is helpful, not necessarily because you have to, but what it does is it opens a lot of doors up for you to meet new people and do some networking. Um, in addition to, um, you know, some of those requirements we also require letters of recommendation, right? And so if you have a lot of people that you can go to for really high quality letters of recommendation that people are able to really speak to, you know, your professional development, your career goals, your academics, whatever that is, that they are able to um, really speak to that and not just say, oh, well, this person showed up for one shift and she showed up on time and that was great. And, you know, but I only met her for eight hours. And so it's it's really hard for me to kind of speak to to how she is as a as a student or an applicant. And we see that quite a bit um, with letters of recommendation that you'll you'll get these kind of very short um, and, and very nice recommendations, but they don't really speak to who you are as a as a candidate or who you could be as a PA. Right. And so being able to, um, you know, make relationships, have relationships with the people that you're going to be asking to do these letters of recommendation um, can really help you to stand out as a candidate as well. And so, you know, if you are going to only shadow somebody for, you know, an eight hour shift or something, that's okay, because I realize that shadowing experiences are very difficult for students to come by. But what I would say is, you know, when you're first matched up with that person, you know, start a conversation with them, whether it's a, a, a virtual call like this or a phone call, or if you're able to meet that person um, it live, or even if it's just over email, you know, explain to them who you are and what your career goals are and why you're going into, you know, trying to get into a PA program. Give them some background about you and start a dialogue so that they can get to know you a little bit before you would even have that shift show up for that shift, be very engaged, have questions prepared, you know, be able to talk through things with them and then try to your best to continue that relationship. Don't just walk out that door and say, oh, okay, that was a lot of fun. I learned a lot, great. Try to continue that relationship with that person. They may be a very valuable resource for you in the future. And so that's something that I would say to, you know, establishing relationships with, you know, whether it's someone you're shadowing, whether it's a supervisor that you're working with, whether it's, it was your, you know, instructor or professor that you had or an, an academic advisor or, you know, maybe a coach or or you know, whatever that might be that you're gonna ask that person of, really make sure essentially they know who you are, right? And they're able to speak to a lot of um, your different um, characteristics, traits, and those kinds of things. Um, I hope that answers your question. I know that was probably a lot. <laughs> yes, thank you. Sure. Um, Lauren Betts, I hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> yes, that's right, thank you. So I had a question about the clinical rotations and I kind of wanted to know how we are placed at certain places, what the locations are, like do we have a choice or is it all from you? Sure, good question. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of answers to that question. So I'm gonna, I'll try to get them all. And if I um, miss anything, please, please let me know. So essentially our clinical rotations, um, we have a, a, a clinical rotation management system that students are able to go in and view the sites that we have, that we um, have vetted, that we have used in the past. And they're actually able to create a wish list. Now in saying that, 
Does everybody get all of their top choices? No, not necessarily. But at least you're able to, to create that and have some say in what you want to do um, with your clinical year. As far as where are the sites located, um, we certainly do have quite a few sites in the, the greater Pittsburgh area and surrounding areas. But I will say that um, our main you know, contract partner with that is, is UPMC, right? That's who we work with, um, but it is not our only contract. And so we do have sites across the country. Um, as our graduates continue to sort of disseminate across the, across the globe, um, we have had many of them who have come back to us and said, hey, I'm more than willing to be a preceptor for your students, but I'm in Alaska. And I'm like, hey, if I can find a student who wants to go to Alaska, I'll send them. And we have actually done that. I've had two students. Um, and so it really just depends on where the sites are and where the placements um, are available for you for that year. And they do tend to change year to year. Um, you know, every year we have sites that stop taking students. We have new sites that start taking students. You know, uh, we have sites that take more one year, less one year, you know, that kind of thing. And so it is kind of a very moving target. Um, but that wish list does try to help to um, sort of at least give the students a little bit of, of say into what they want to do and where they might want to go. So that's that part of it. The last part of it is that we, um, while we do not require or ever re will we require you to find your own site, if you want to do that and you want to start a new affiliation agree agreement with another um, you know, local health system or a private practice somewhere or something like that, we are open to working with students on that. Um, I will say that it, it doesn't always work out. There are some places that just will not sign a contract with the University of Pittsburgh um, because they are maybe loyal to programs that are, are very close to them or something like that. Um, and so that's a little bit out of our control, but we are certainly work, uh, we will work with you to, to do that if there is um, availability or capacity that way. I hope I answered all your questions and if I didn't, feel free to speak up. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, um, let's see, Morgan Hartman, go ahead. Hi, um, my question was for you as well as the students. I was wondering what the culture is like. Is it more like collaborative versus competitive? I am gonna pass that off to one of the students if that's okay with you. Um, and uh, I, there's a whole bunch of you on there. So I'm gonna let one of you take it. Um, so if you guys, uh, or you all, sorry, you all go ahead and do that. And if I can pop in or chime in, if you need me, let me know. Uh, I can start. Did you want to go, Diana? Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, I think uh, my art class, so I'm in the didactic year. I think we do really well with collaborating. We um, are really good with like sharing notes and uh, keeping each other like Thought, like on the schedule, making sure we remind each other of things. Um, I don't feel it's competitive at all. Um, and I hope that if you were accepted to your class would do the same. It is technically like a class to class thing, but we, we've heard the same from all the other classes that is very non-competitive with them as well. Um, and we're all like, it's very, very teamwork based. Yeah, I would add off that and say not only structurally is it not competitive because no one's competing to get into a graduate school, um, but moreover, just the nature of the field, you know, we're interdisciplinary. You know, the people that you are going to school with are going to be your future colleagues. So not only is there a culture of collaboration, making sure no one gets left behind just because we care about one another, but it's in the spirit of the profession and the uh, program itself. Thank you, Andrew and Diana. Those were both great answers. And I'm, I'm glad those were your answers because that would have been my answer. <laughs> um, and, and we as, as faculty and staff, um, we feel very strongly about um, enhancing that collaborative environment as well. Um, you know, I, I, I have to admit, I remember, um, you know, hearing horror stories about other PA programs who posted, you know, grades on the walls so people could see who had done well on tests and things like that. And I, I mean, truly horror stories, right? Like, why would you ever do that to somebody? Um, and so we are very, very collaborative. Um, I think as a faculty and staff, we, we try to model that for our students as well. We all get along very well. We um, welcome adjunct faculty. We welcome our graduates to come back and assist and things like that too. And so we really do try to foster that environment. So I'm glad to hear that the, the students not only echo that, but also feel, um, you know, feel that they're able to accomplish that as well. So thank you um, both for answering. 
Um, let's see. Uh, Zane, and I don't want to mispronounce your last name. Will you pronounce it for me? <laughs> it's El Gogri. El Gogri. Thank you. Um, go awesome. ahead with your question. So my question was, I know on the website, I saw something about like PA studies for everyone and approach to like um, tackle diversity, equity, and inclusion. What kind of opportunities do you have for students to kind of get involved in community medicine and participate in different um, aspects that aren't necessarily related to like in the classroom learning, but getting involved with the community as well? Sure. So I am actually going to let the students take that one, too, because I know that some of them are working very hard and very diligently on these things. Um, the program is doing every week, everything we can to support them in that initiative, um, as well as starting to really look at our own curriculum and ensuring that those um, that diversity, inclusion, all of those pieces are part of our curriculum and are spread across the curriculum, not only in the didactic component, but also in the clinical year and things like that. Um, there was a, a module that was just sent out to our um, adjunct faculty uh, based on that um, because you know adjunct faculty we don't always see them every day and sometimes they aren't always here and so we developed this module to try and enhance that piece of their learning um, so that they can also bring that into the classroom and so I'll go ahead and let one of the um, or one or two of the students um, also give that from their perspective as well. Hi, so I can um, talk about that uh, if that's okay. So my name is Hon um, and I'm actually uh, the co-president for the PA Student Promoting Diversity and Inclusion organization in our uh, cohort. Um, so I'd be happy to talk about it because actually um, diversity and inclusion was like a big thing that drew me toward to Pittsburgh. You pit, like I think I saw what you exactly would talk about. I think when I first went on a website, I'm just like, oh my God, they really striving for this like mission for diversity and inclusion on it. being here, I can 100% tell you that it is very true. And to this day, it's still like the number one thing I love about it. So right now, so one way that like we can definitely really get involved and promote more about diversity is like being in this club. Um, I think Lauren here is also like in a club with me too. She actually my business manager. So I want to quick shout out to her. Um, and Anna here in this session is actually diversity co-chair for PA Student Society. So we all work really closely together to promote diversity um, in different ways. So for PSPDI, it was the organization, we send out a monthly journal based on different topics to really educate people about, um, you know, something that may have not been addressed all the time in healthcare, like last, um, last month, uh, chairs, the past president sent out an article regarding how um, post oximeter meter was not very accurate on black a patient. And last this month, uh, one of our officers sent an article to celebrate the diversity of women in PA profession, because as we may know, the diversity in the profession was very um, limited throughout time. And so upcoming actually um, next month, I'm actually planning an event to address the systemic racism and healthcare disparity in the AAPI community with this Asian American Pacific um, community. So that's, you know, so that's just like some way that like, you know, shouldn't really get involved, really promoting the diversity in the um, cohort. And our professor are always super like perceptive to hearing about it. I think we can all agree that like in all our lecture, we hear so much about diversity inclusion in different way. And um, I'm actually even like meeting with one of our professor this week to even talk about how to include more um, ethnic skin clinical manifestation in our clinical education so that we can be more well-rounded and stuff. And upcoming soon, you actually see, we'll see more information about how PIT um, really promote diversity and inclusion because we are um, talking about launching the website for that today. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Hon. That was fantastic. <laughs> Much better than I could have put it. Um, and I, I will echo that. We um, are doing everything we, we can to support them and, um, you know, really trying to get those resources out there um, for not only our students, but, you know, applicants and, and really anyone that wants to look at our website, right? Um, we're, we're really trying to, to do the best we can with that and are certainly open to all suggestions um, and and we we really depend on our students for that. You know, we appreciate their feedback. We take it very seriously, and we do we do our best to um, incorporate those suggestions into the curriculum. So, thank you again for your answer. Um, okay, let's see. I have uh, Ashley uh, Ricardino. I hope I said that right. If I didn't, please correct me. Yeah, you're good. Um, I was wondering for the students how you guys manage finances with, you know, PA school being a full time thing. So like taking out extra loans and how do you afford like 
to get places and to feed yourself and everything. So that's a really, oh, go ahead. No, you can go ahead. No, thank you. Um, that's a really good question. And I think that's definitely something that I was really concerned about coming into PA school. But um, you can take out some extra loans. I know not everyone likes to do that, but I wouldn't really recommend like working in the program. I am thinking of maybe doing like, if you had a super part-time thing, like a DoorDash type situation or something like that, you could probably make that work. Um, but I wouldn't recommend like part-time employment during the program, honestly. Um, there are resources though, like you definitely can take out um, some extra loans and um, that can help you pay for your living expenses. Yeah, if I could just build off of that real quick. Um, the way that we, uh, I, I really wouldn't recommend a part-time or even per diem job just because the curriculum is so focused, so fast and so intense. Um, but thankfully we have a pretty robust uh, financial aid office. So if you have any questions at all, I found that the financial aid office is a really good um, service. And I, I don't know, I'd have to pass this uh, to Professor Murphy. I don't know if you guys have a financial aid interview or what's it meeting after interviews, but I think we did. And they were able to ask some of those basic questions. What's covered by your initial application to uh, FAFSA? Uh, in addition to that, I think almost all of us qualify for graduate plus loans. So there are options out there. Um, but unfortunately, I know it's stressful for a lot of people. You almost do have to kick the uh, financial can down the road because there is so much information to cover. I don't know if I can recommend being distracted by it for too long every week by a part-time job. Thank you. Both. I just, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I just want to add, though, this is like something like I think like just a quick advice like financial planning before coming to school too, because I know it's uh, expensive. I know like Anna Maria and Anna, Andrew already talk about like how we don't recommend working and how to, and probably, and we have option like from financial aid and loan. Um, so prospectively, you know, like obviously if you do get in, like I say, you still have like from now until a year later, I think early financial planning is really good as well. Like that's something that's like why I'm not stressing out about financial too much because um, I'm like really into um, financial literacy, but I mean, if you able to, you know, you to working right now, I think you'll have some sort of like early financial planning ahead of time, like a saving account or um, look into your saving thing, like um, in exit days or how I forgot, like even like, so I know this sounds crazy, like your retirement plan stuff too. That's, I mean, having all the financial planning stuff ahead of time in your future to, toward even going to school, that helped you a little bit better when you visualize about your investment going to school because you're like oh my god now I'm putting like thousand of like sorry 100k worth in tuition but then like if you have this financial down it's really help you visualize how you're going to budget this and another thing too that can help with you like budgeting during like PA school or even in college in general is that like you really look into like your credit card like benefit because that there's a lot of things that helps a lot like me and my classmate were talking how like we are not basically paying for our flight upcoming because we're we really maximizing those benefits so there are little things and here and there that you can that can help you do your financial planning a lot better so that you're not stressing too much about why being PA school thank you so much yeah their answers were all better than mine that's for sure so um I will say that the the program does um agree with the, what the students said. It, it is a full-time program. It's very difficult to work, but if there is something that you can do, like some of the suggestions they gave you on a very, very part-time basis or something like that, you know, you're able to do that, but you know yourself and you know what you can manage and, and what you can do as far as your own workload and, and, and studying and things like that as well. I saw a whole bunch of resources were popping up in the chat for people as far as um, within the, the, the pit system, as far as financial aid. And I also um, saw somebody, I was glad they popped it in there, the uh, Pennsylvania State Society of Physician Assistants, the PSPA, um, and every state has one of these constituent organizations of the large national organization, AAPA. And so if you're interested in, um, you know, if you're not necessarily from Pennsylvania, which, you know, I'm sure not everyone is, um, looking into resources that some of they, those um, uh, societies have are also good options. Um, sometimes they offer scholarships. 
um, and things like that as well. And so I would certainly direct you to some of those. Um, they're not always a lot of money, but hey, if you can, you know, get a thousand dollars here and two thousand dollars here or something like that, it's 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 helpful, right? It it might help pay for your medical equipment or or whatever it is you need. And so I would certainly direct you to those um, state societies. Typically, a student membership is much, much cheaper than a, a fellow membership for those. And so um, if, if it is something that you have to be a member of, you know, PSPA or, or whatnot, a lot of times those memberships are very, very inexpensive. And so you not only then have that membership to add to your um, CV or resume, um, but you are also have access to all the resources that they have. And both organizations, AAPA and all of the state organizations, have a lot of resources for prospective students and current students. And so I would definitely advise you to look into a lot of those as well. Um, let's see. Um, Professor, oh. I did want to add to that too. I actually forgot yeah. to mention this, but there is actually a really good um, organization for healthcare students in that supply. that give you scholarship money that I'm actually in right now. Um, this program, I think it's not very well popular, but it's called York Washington Healthcare Opportunity uh, Program. It's mainly geared toward um, disadvantaged students, but they are a very good program that they will, when you get accepted, they not only give you a stipend but of $3,000, but they also gonna give you financial support toward at least at most to one 10K per year. Um, so that's a really good resource. That's amazing. I was not aware of that one. Would you, um, I think you, did you put that information in the chat? I think I saw. Yeah, I kind of mentioned that. Let me see if I can put a link to the application for this cycle close already, but. I mean, it's open again every year. And I think it's a really good um, program that, like I said, like not only they supply financial support, like I think for this semester, I got 3K, which is really not, I mean, honestly, any dollar help, but it's a really good organization that help give you like financial support. And also they really teach you a lot of different things, healthcare too, like research and financial literacy. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, and then one other um, resource I wanted to um, tell you about is also looking into um, some of the, um, you know, scholarship and thing like and things like that opportunities from, um, you know, even local health systems and things like that. Um, for instance, the VA um, sometimes will offer stipends for students to complete their rotations through the, the different VA hospitals. And um, I think we have a student doing that this year, if I remember correctly. And so again, any money helps, right, when you're a student. And so, you know, looking at some of that as well, you might want to um, just, you know, peruse some of those uh, local sites as well. So I just wanted to put that off there. Um, okay, and thank you uh, all the didactic students again for, for all those resources. Um, Samantha, is it, I hope, Spina or Spina, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you're the first time, it's Spina. Okay. Um, I was just wondering what type of students are most successful in this program? I can give you my little uh, answer to that, but again, um, the students are much closer to it than I am, so maybe they can give you some some ways that they've found to be successful. Um, but as far as my answer, and, and this is kind of a, an answer we give to all the students when they're interviewing for us as well, is that I think time management is probably the most important thing to have as a PA student, right? Um, really being able to look at your day, look at your week and say, okay, the, this is what I need to accomplish. And knowing what your limitations are, right? And knowing that you still need to build in self-care and, and being aware of, of what your needs are to, to just take care of yourself. PA school is not easy and it's fast and it goes fast. And so there's a a large volume of information and um, you know being able to manage your time appropriately I think is really what sets a, a very successful student apart from somebody who might be struggling a little bit more and um, if you can come into the program with a plan about how you're going to do that I think that will set you up for success. Um, additionally understanding that PA school will end I promise it will, it's not forever, um, you know, and while you're living it, it doesn't feel that way. Um, I, I remember those days, but, um, you know, remembering that it, it will end and that your goal is to work in medicine and care for your patients and that, you know, doing everything you can in PA school to get to that, um, you know, final goal of becoming a physician assistant and working in medicine is such, such a huge responsibility but also such an enormous honor to be able to treat patients who are at their very worst 
um, and, and help them, right? It's a huge honor. It's a huge privilege to do that for another human being. And I think if you're able to hold on to that during your journey through PA school and, and know that there is a, an end in sight, um, that will also help to get you through those tough testing weeks or those, you know, tough clinical rotation days or, or whatnot. So that would be my answer. But um, if anyone, if any one of the students want to speak up, feel free to go ahead and do that as well. And then we'll move on. I would say yeah. that one quality. I'm having a habit of talking over everyone. Sorry, please go it's ahead. Yeah. Fun, <laughs> Hi, everyone. So I'm Kevin. Um, I'd like to elaborate a little bit on finding the, the balance during didactic year. Um, like Professor Murphy was saying, um, you might, when you first join the program, at least when I first joined the program, the workload was extremely overwhelming and it, it can still be uh, for sure. But um, to some extent, spending your entire day studying can, ultimate, can actually be detrimental to your performance in the classes. So um, definitely find the balance and find the time uh, in your day to actually spend doing something that you actually, that like, is not related to school um, at all. Don't feel guilty, you know, taking a couple hours, um, you know, maybe watching videos or going to the gym because ultimately that is gonna help you return back to your studying with a, a fresher mind. Yeah, if I could build off of that a little, I would just say the number one, if I could summarize in a word, it's gonna be consistency. Um, the reality is you're going to need to take time for yourself, um, but I much rather you study four or five hours a day every day than burn out, you know, and get 12 hours of studying done the next day, get another eight hours and then just be down for the count for the rest of the week. You do have to pace yourself. Um, but I think the best piece of advice that I can give not only for PA school uh, but for the application process is the only thing that's going to get you through it is persistence. Not everything's going to go your way. Um, you're not going to get accepted or given interviews for every school you apply to. And once you're in a program, sometimes you're going to get grades that, you know, you wish you had gotten better grades. Um, but the number one thing is not to dwell on it. Just keep moving forward. And that is what I found is really the key to getting through PA school. Also, I, also I, oh, sorry. You can go ahead, Kat. Oh, thank you. I also think it's important um, that you find like your friendships too in your cohort because we have only been at this for a couple of months, the didactic students. And I would say that we're really close, <laughs> even though we see just little pictures of each other and we just like type on group me. But like, I would say that we're all like pretty close and we can go to each other for pretty much anything. And I think that's really important to start creating those relationships with the people that you start to come in contact with, because they're going to be pretty much one of the only people that's going to understand what you're going through. So just like being making sure to build those connections and just um, being open with the people that you're going to be in the same cohort with. Um, also, like, uh, we've had a couple like study skill sessions from some of our professors, which have been really helpful. And some of them explain like the Pomodoro technique, which is like 25 minutes of studying five minutes off, or you could do 50 and 10. Um, that way you're just, uh, you're not getting too burnt out sitting there hours upon hours upon hours, because you will eventually do that. Like I drag myself to my desk every day, even when I'm like, I should go to bed, but there I am. Um, but it is definitely important having a balance and um, like Kat was saying, have a good like group of people, but also don't be afraid. Like if you, like once you start, you'll kind of get into like your little group of studying friends, but don't be afraid to switch that group if you need to, um, because you might find like that isn't the best group where you're going to be the most successful. Um, and then also like, I, I might be the oldest in the class, but I don't know, but I'm married and have two small, small children. And so for me, it's also a balance of being a little bit selfish and, um, you know, really focusing on, you know, what your ultimate goal is here. And like um, Professor Murphy said, like there is a deadline. So knowing that, you know, like we, we will get out, we'll be okay. Um, but just knowing like you have to be disciplined um, to put in the time, but at the same, at the same time, let yourself breathe a little bit when you can. And don't feel guilty about it because if you're not breathing, well, as PAs, we all know what happens, but. 
Uh, and if I could, sorry, but in just one more, one thing I really do want to say is use your classmates for the resource that they are, especially from the class that I'm coming from. We have athletic trainers, lab technologists, paramedics. We have people who have worked in every field of every different, um, you know, healthcare setting. There are people who are very knowledgeable when it comes to anatomy or very knowledgeable when it comes to the clinical sciences part of it. The reality is you're going to have someone to turn to who's very knowledgeable about the subject that you're covering in class that week. And don't be afraid to reach out to those people to get someone to explain it at the level that you're at. Thank you all. Um, you hit on so many points that I didn't even think about. So I really appreciate it. And I agree with everything that they said. Um, you know, it, it, you have to remember to take care of yourself and for sure use your classmates as a resource. Um, I am actually currently just finishing up the uh, educational doctorate program at Pitt. And we have a cohort of a, a very similar amount. There's about 60 of us. And I have to say that I am living the student life the way that they are right now. We see each other in little boxes and we use GroupMe and we talk. And I have to say that I, I would have had a real hard time um, working, taking care of my family, my son, um, and doing this doctoral program without the support of my cohort. And so I, I think that's a really valuable thing as well. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your answers. Thank you all. Um, um, Anna, is it Picciano? It's Picciano. Don't worry, no one gets it right. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> I kind of had two questions. Um, they kind of relate. Um, so the first one was, do you find that like most students work in a particular clinical setting or field after graduation? And then in addition to that, do most people stay in Pittsburgh or do they kind of venture out? Um, yeah. Sure. Great questions. Um, so I would say that it's hard to sort of put a, a, a who, where do they go? Who do, who do they work for? I would say that we there is not a specialty that a lot of students go to. It is across the board. Um, and I think that's really nice. Um, and I think it speaks highly of our program too, because they're trained um, well enough that they feel comfortable going into all of these different specialties, right? I have graduates doing everything from, you know, family medicine to pediatric oncology. I have a student who even works within a subspecialty of that, who, who works in just sickle cell anemia uh, within that department. And so, um, so yeah, it would be hard to say, but um, I would say that I, I think it's a benefit knowing that students work in any area because it, it doesn't limit you to where you might go. Um, as far as where do they end up uh, location wise, um, I think, it, it's a kind of a mix of both there too. I think a lot of the local students who, um, you know, are from here and, and, and go to Pitt and planned on staying, you know, they, they typically end up staying. Um, but we have a fair number who, um, you know, say, hey, I'm here, but the first thing I want to do is leave, right? Like I, I'm finishing my degree and this is where I want to move. Um, but it really is student dependent or graduate dependent, I guess I should say at that point. Um, and it depends on, you know, what kind of position you want, um, where they're located. Um, you know, sometimes there's not a lot of one particular specialty open where they want to live. And so they might move somewhere else to, to, to get that particular specialty. Or, you know, there is a special area that they want to go to. And so they're willing to take really any position that they could get depending on where they want to move. And that was me as a graduate. I knew I was moving to Pittsburgh, but beyond that, I didn't know. And so I just applied to everything I could find and and took the job that that fit me the best at that point. And so, again, I, I think that also speaks um, pretty highly of, of the profession itself, because you're not locked in. You're not locked into a specialty and you're not locked into a location. Uh, the job market for PAs is um, has been slowed a little bit because of the pandemic, but really is still is still very good. So. Thank you. Sure. Um, Sarah Staley, I hope I said that right. <laughs> Hi, um, I just wanted to know how common is it for your students to take a gap year between undergrad and graduate? And then if any of the students have done it here, what was like the most valuable part of that? Sure, so I'll quickly answer the first part and then I'll let the students, um, any of them that may have done that speak to it. Um, so we have a, a, because we are a master's only program, we have a really wide variety of students. And so I think that, you know, there are 
a number of students who come to us, you know, graduated in April and May and start with us in January, but there is a, a number of students who do take that year because they're just finishing up a couple of requirements or they wanted to work for a year or something like that. And then we do still have a, a fair number of students who are true second career students, right? Maybe they had been practicing as a paramedic for quite a number of years and decided they wanted to further their education and get into physician assistant studies. And so it's a really nice mix. Um, and I apologize, I think it was Andrew, but I, I can't remember if it wasn't, excuse me, um, who, who highlighted, you know, the differences among the cohort, right? And how you can use your students, um, the students in your cohort as your resources, because we they do come from such a wide variety of backgrounds. You have the athletic trainers that can help with the orthopedic module. You have the EKG techs who can help with the cardiology module and things like that. So it is a pretty wide variety of students. And I would say that it's um, a fair number of students in each of those um, categories, which is nice. And then I'll go ahead and open it up to the students to sort of answer that um, second part about it. If you did take a gap year or not and how that worked for you. Hi, sir. So I actually did take a gap year after undergrad. Uh, I graduated uh, undergrad in 2019, and so I took one gap year. Um, for the most part, the main reason I decided to take a gap year is because I wanted to gain more clinical experience. Um, during my undergrad, I did get some clinical experiences done, but I didn't feel like I had enough to prepare me uh, well for PA school. So I decided to spend my gap year getting my EMT certification and working as an EMT. And I definitely would say that that one gap year that I took was incredibly instrumental to my confidence as a student uh, in the program. Um, so I wouldn't feel guilty to take gap years uh, in between undergrad and grad school because ultimately they can be very beneficial to your education when you start a PA program. Hi, Sarah. Um, so I actually took several gap years, way more than Kevin like six times more, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I took a lot of gap years. So um, in between those times I worked in different fields um, and I mainly, I mean, there wasn't really a reason why I chose to take those gap years. It was just when I felt like I was ready to apply for school. That's when, you know, I hit that submit button. Um, but in between my gap years, I worked in different fields and I loved every single part of my jobs there. It helped me really hone in on my, like um, my patient skills. Um, and I think it actually really matured me. And I think the, you know, get, getting more like clinical hours really kind of um, helped my application. Um, so if you feel like you need to take some gap years, it's, you know, we have, we have students coming from a wide, like there's no one like typical student. Um, so if you feel like you need to take some, some, uh, some gap years, um, it wouldn't, you know, it, it would just, uh, how do I say this, strengthen your application. Going off that too, in a lot of ways, of course, I might be biased because I took several gap years. Um, but I think d don't be afraid of taking gap years. It will, like uh, Diana said, it will only help. It will only help you, even if it's not necessarily in a health related field. Mine certainly, my life before this was certainly not health related. Um but it'll help you understand like the workforce and your role in the workforce and how to better time manage. Um, so it really is only beneficial. It makes you a more mature candidate. And it just, again, helps you with your time management, helps you prioritize and just under helps you understand your role, um, whether, you know, in healthcare or otherwise, which I think is really important. I think something that's important to acknowledge is that there is no typical PA story. There's people in our class that have done just enough, you know, healthcare experience and have spent most of their lives on the academic side. There's other people who have spent an entire life in a different career, and those are both viable options um, and have their strengths. And as you guys are applying, lean into that and lean into the fact that your story is unique um, because it's hard to stick out as an applicant. So. If you spent, you know, lots of time working, lots of time in research, those are all viable approaches to be a PA. Don't shy away from what your story is or the story that you're crafting, um, because the reality is there is no wasted time. As long as you're experiencing, you know, working, academia, different parts of the healthcare field, all of that is completely valuable and, you know, just contributes to the greater whole of the Pitt PA program. I, I would like to say something. Um, I have worked in healthcare for 30 years 
And you got to remember, everything's growth. We're constantly growing. What we, every failure is succession. We learn what not to do. So you become better prepared. And sometimes we go through this imposter syndrome where we don't think we're, we're in the right field. We're overwhelmed. And then we'll start seeing everything come to past and say, oh, I, I misjudged that. I'm really ready for this. Some people need the time off to get in that place. But really, you really know if you're ready or not. As soon as it starts, you're going to know, yeah, this is tough. I have to come out of, I have to come out of my safe zone, but I'm going to perceive this because a lot of us are in the safe zone for so long and it's all new and we're scared and we're nervous and we're afraid of failing, hurting people, all this stuff. We have, we're overwhelmed with all this stuff, but it all comes to a point where it just becomes your reality and you keep growing from it. So I just wanted to say that this is a perspective too, is it's all part of growing and finding who we are. That was me. <laughs> uh, well, thank you to all the didactic students. And uh, Sarah, I would have to say, I agree with you. And, um, you know, even being a PA for quite a few years that I'm not even going to admit right now, because I don't want to, um, <laughs> I, I still live that. I still live in imposter syndrome. I still sometimes think, how did I get here? Am I prepared to do this? Um, but I was actually going to call on you next anyway. So if you wanted to go ahead and ask your question, uh, go ahead. <laughs> um, so I've been in the healthcare field for a long time. I've worked with PAs for many years, but I'm being advised I still need um, shadowing, PA shadowing. Am I still going to need so many hours working specifically with the PA? So we, we at Pitt do not require shadowing. Um, we okay. just recommend it. And so it sounds like you may have already fulfilled that obligation for us. We do not require it. Um, there may be pro some programs that do. And so I would advise you to kind of ask them um, at, at, at whatever their um, university or college is. But at the Pitt PA program, we, we just recommend it, um, which it sounds like you, you work very closely with them and that would certainly be able to, you know, they would be able to speak to that for you. Um, so sounds like you're good from our perspective. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and next on my list, sorry here. Um, and I hope I don't say this wrong. If I do, please correct me. Is it Amna Abdelisamad? Uh, yes, it's Amna. Um, uh, hello everyone, my name is Amna. Uh, I just have uh, a question on the CASPA application. Uh, I saw there's an achievement uh, section. I was curious like what things um, are you looking for here? So that's a, a really good question. Um, I would say any honors or certificates or, um, boy, I'm trying to think of what else you might call it. Um, you know, any anything like that that you might have, you know, achieved in addition to something you might have done would be what you would put in that category. Does that make sense? Like if you had a maybe an um, honor or a, um, something like that, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. But I was confused because I think there's like an achievement section and a, another separate cer certification. Oh, I so, so those, yeah. So certifications, I think, is more along the lines of like your um, CPR certification, like those types of things. But maybe if you had taken, um, you know, an honors course or maybe you had gotten a, a leadership certificate or something like that, that would be um, more of an achievement that those... I will say CASPA can be a little bit confusing with those types of things. And so um, anywhere that you put something, it's there and we will see it, um, you know, but that that would be my advice is that the certifications are probably more like BLS or um, ACLS and things like that. And then the, the achievements would maybe be honors or designations um, that you may have received from other things. Thank you so much. You're welcome. No problem. Um, let's see here. Um, is it Reina? Rina? Rina, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, hi, so I, this kind of goes along with um, a question from a few questions ago, but I saw on the website that it's, uh, you guys require 500 um, patient care hours minimum, but I was just wondering if there was a certain number that the admissions are looking for that would make a student or make a 
applicant more competitive or just well, like, a, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, good question. Um, so I don't know how other PA programs handle it, and they may handle it differently. But as far as the PIT PA program, it's a checkoff. So if you hit 500 hours, you've been checked off for that requirement, and that's all you need to do. We do not look at candidates differently because of how many hours they have for the exact reasons that the students sort of have been talking about is that, you know, we value anyone's experience that they bring to the program. And, and we really do pride ourselves on the, the um, variety of people that are in our cohorts. And I think everyone brings value, no matter if you're right out of school or you've coming back after 10 years, or you've done 500 hours or 50,000 hours, you know, um, there's something to be said for all of that experience that is brought into the program. So. Um, let's see, uh, Rachel Hosack. Yeah, hi, um, I just kind of had a question about curriculum. So something that I'm concerned with going into the program is learning communication effectively because textbook material is something I'm not gonna say it's easy to learn, but it's in a textbook. Um, so I was wondering if there's anything like academic community engagement or um, community clinical hours, just because um, I would just wanna be sure that I'm able to communicate with a wide range of patients um, and not just those in the Pittsburgh area where we're gonna be learning this stuff, I assume. Sure, so we actually have a, a whole course, Patient Education and Counseling, which is dedicated to exactly what you're talking about how to communicate effectively with patients from all backgrounds, right? I mean, that is what the course is about. And so that, that is dedicated there. We also use standardized patients, um, patient actors, standardized patient actors who come into the program and help our students to develop those skills. And then during the clinical year, um, you are able to do your clinical time, you know, like I, I spoke about earlier, um, in a wide variety of settings that certainly will not all occur in the Pittsburgh area. And one of the reasons for that is because I think that if every student completed every rotation at UPMC Presbyterian, they would not learn about a lot of different backgrounds, right? Because I mean, Pittsburgh is Pittsburgh. And so um, we do try to get students out into a variety of locations, a variety of settings um, during that year to, to enhance those skills as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And let's see, um, Nicole? Yeah, my question was, um, did uh, of the like students that are here on the call that we've been hearing from, um, how long did it take them to get accepted into the program? Like, are, um, you know, like if, if you get, you know, if you don't get accepted your first time, is it, you know, two years? I, I, you know, I understand everybody has a different background and whatnot, but if you could just speak to that a little bit. Uh, two, it took me, I'm going to say two and a half tries uh, to get to PA school, uh, which is why I want to say persistence is key. Um, I kind of probed uh, the first time, but I was towards the end of the application cycle. I applied in earnest twice, and it was the second time that I got in. Um, the best advice, and it, it almost sounds fake, um, that I've heard is there will be a program that you just click with. Uh, you know, culturally, you appreciate what they're offering, and they appreciate what you're offering. I know that when you're in the application process and you just want to find a school that'll take you, that sounds a little cheesy. It sounds a little fairy tale esque, um, but that's definitely what happened with me. And it's a story that I hear from a lot of other PAs um, is what you're offering and what you're looking for will kind of match up. And eventually you will find uh, a PA program that fits you well. Um, I found that in Pitt. Hopefully you guys do too. Um, but above all else, I would say don't let a failed application cycle get you down. Um, a lot of us have been through it. <laughs> And going off that, um, I like I think uh, for me, I because of like my life situation with just like not being able to relocate or drop 20 applications, I only applied to five schools and Pitt was my number one choice. And I was so I'm still I still can't believe like I got in like on the first cycle. It's still very surreal to me. But if the if Pitt is your dream school, whatever dream school is, or maybe you don't have one, but really tailor your application to that school. You know, look up, I think you guys are doing it by looking up on the website. I mean, I could probably tell you everything on Pitt's website right now. That's how insane I was about it. Okay. I attended all these info sessions just because I wanted to have all the info. So like 
tailor your application, whichever schools really tug at your heartstrings or cordae tendine, as we know, um, really, really, dad joke, right? Really tailor your application to that school. Um, you will just increase your chances of getting in. And it sounds like really simple, but in a way it is really simple. If you, if, you know, if you have your top five schools or whatever, if you tailor that application, they're going to see that, that they are as much a perfect fit as you are a perfect fit for them. Um, I want to go out with Lauren too. Honestly, shout out to you girl with the Cornish Kennedy. Sorry, I have to do that. But honest, yeah, so I also, a um, I took gap year and I a reapplicant too. It took me about two cycles, uh, probably about two and a half cycles to get in as well. And I honestly really think that, uh, you know, even PA school, obviously PA school is hard, but I think what make you really success to get into PA school it's like really truly know like who you are, like what you stand for. Because, you know, and I think like for me, like obviously I think that was like why I think I think didn't get to the first few cycle because I I mean like you know I kind of have idea like where I want to go. But I think I was also kind of going with the mentality like, oh you know, Bayer can't be cuser. I'm gonna apply like Bradley. But then I think this cycle, I think after like learning from my private interview experience, I kind of know exactly what I am like Lawrence uh, said to you. Like, I really look into each school website, really to find out what school was like the best for me that matched my mission. And my mission is really about like serving as a serve and promoting diversity and inclusion, like I mentioned. So Pitt was just like a hit right on, like the best school that I could find that really matched everything that I love. And for me, then that process was just like, it just almost like happened all naturally, like everything fall into places. Like I re um, reapply obviously like, early last year. And then like Pitt interviewed me, like the, my first interview and I got in like two weeks after. And it was just like, the most amazing process because like I think that's just kind of when you know like you pick the right play for you and then right now like I said like Pitt really offering me everything that I ever asked for and like I'm also I'm from California and you would think I used to like think that like oh you know like I obviously have a reference for like I didn't think I would go out of state because I wanted to go to school with like the most diversity possible but Pitt really stand out like I'm saying this I would not pick any of the school that I got waitlist for last cycle over pay. like that's how much I love the schools right now. Um, just to kind of you know put everything that everyone has said together, I also uh, um, had to do had to apply twice, um, and this isn't necessarily just like towards Pitt, but like the application process um, since you know that's over for us. But I still remember feeling so sad like it was a really rough Andrew <laughs> it's like he agrees <laughs> I um you know it was a really rough like first application cycle because I was waitlisted and this will happen to some people too that you get waitlisted from a school and you don't know until literally the next cycle opens if you got into that school or not but um I think someone else are asked in the the uh, chat also if it's normal or if it's you know if it's normal for students to have to take more than two cycles to get in or one cycle to get in I wouldn't say you know it's normal but it's also not abnormal a lot of students take multiple cycles to get in but it's like you know yes it's a reality check but also like there the school that that you're meant to be at will come along um, if you don't get in that's no you know, that's not a jab at you, you know what you have to offer, you know what your application says, you know, and there's, there's just way too many students. So find what you think is most unique to you, highlight that on your application. And if you are, you know, you get an interview, show that in your interview process. And then if you do you have to apply again, you know, be realistic with yourself, really look at what you can improve on and what you can highlight for the next cycle. What, my, what I'm trying to say is, is there are a lot of students who take multiple cycles to get in that should not deter you from the field if this is what you want to do. Thank you all. Those are wonderful answers and I agree with them as well. Um, and speaking from the admissions committee at Pitt, we get such an enormous amount of wonderful applicants. We could truly fill our class twice. I mean, our, we could. Um, that's how great it is. And so, you know, take their advice. If you don't get in the first time, 
it's probably not because you weren't qualified. It's just that, you know, schools are limited to the amount of students they can take. And, and, and you know, that's sometimes unfortunate. And that's why I always say, you know, don't put all of your eggs in one basket, right? Make sure you're applying to all the schools that you think might fit you best. Um, next question, Adam, is it uh, Dorek uh, Sperber? I hope I said that right. If not, please correct me. <laughs> Yeah, actually, that was that was pretty close. Dot Sperber is good. Uh, a lot of people don't get that on the first try, so so kudos. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank all of the students for making me uh, feel a whole lot better about the fact that my first application cycle hasn't gone according to plan. Um, I mean, but again, then again, what has gone according to plan over the last year? Um, my uh, my question is really directed to the students again. Um, uh, what would you say is your favorite part of the UPIT program? These non skulls. No, honestly, um, above above all else, it's it's our classmates and our faculty. Um, I, I wish I could bottle that and explain it more concisely, um, but it was you know told to me by the PAs I worked with and the faculty that uh, you know we learned from that. Uh, you know, the connections that you make uh, with the people in your cohort are going to last the rest of your life. Um, I had a similar undergrad experience where it was very intense, um, you know, science-based coursework and one cohort moving together. I'm still in touch with all of those guys, and I can't imagine I'm escaping these guys anytime soon. Uh, they're absolutely wonderful, and I hope you guys fall as much in love with your class as I have with mine. Thanks, Andrew. And I see we're getting to the end of time and I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. And I see I have two more questions. Um, Ryan Taylor. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I just want to say I love the energy of the didactic students. This is awesome. <laughs> um, second thing, um, how does Pitt rank the different prerequisite requirements, or not even the prerequisites, just all of the requirements um, as a whole. So like, is patient care more important than GPA or like, what's the most important requirements? Sure. That's a good question. Um, I would say none of them. So we do, and I think someone in the chat, and I, I want to say it was Lauren, um, appreciated sort of the holistic way we look at our applicants. And we truly do that. Um, we have sort of a flow chart about how we review an application, but every single section that you um, put into CASPA is part of that. Right, and so they're all um, part of that flow chart. And as you work through them, as you're reviewing an application, you look at uh, the letters of recommendation, not only the scoring, but the content and, and what are people saying. You look at the GPAs, but then you also look at that um, you know, specific science GPA, but then you look at the patient care experience hours, not only making sure that the 500 hours are there, but what else did that person do and so on and so forth. And so we really do look at every single section and they're all weighted and valued in a very similar way, if that answers your question, hopefully. There's not really one part that is differently weighted. Um, but I will say that, the, um, as I spoke about a little bit before, the way to really stand out is to be able to tell that story. And the way that you can do that is through your personal statement and then also in this um, supplemental essay where you can really plead your own sort of case and highlight who you are and what you've done and help the admissions committee connect the dots of your path. And so we can see that this was your GPA, but this is what else you did. And this is the, the you know, maybe the patient care experience that you had, but this is what you learned from it and, and where your path led you. Hopefully that helps a little bit. And um, let's see, I think Rachel, did you pop up with another question or was that an old hand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's another question and hopefully sure. quick. Um, it's kind of a half glass or a glass half empty question. Um, is there anything, uh, this is for the students, is there anything that you guys kind of found that you didn't quite like um, in your journey to becoming a PA? I know that's kind of a sad question, but um, yeah. Are you asking me as a person who practices now, or are you asking this for the students and how they got into school, just so I understand? Both, um, if there's answers to both. Sure, um, and so we do only have a, about five minutes left, right, Nicole? Am I correct on that? Yep. 
Okay, um, so I, I will try to answer it briefly and then maybe if we want to have one student answer, um, because I see one more question popped up and I just want to make sure that we get to as many as we possibly can. Um, I would say the only thing that I didn't like about my journey to PA school or being a PA was that, um, and this was so long ago that um, I don't think it happens much anymore, is that there wasn't a lot of weight put on interprofessional and interdisciplinary education when I was a, a physician assistant student. I don't know if it just wasn't a thing at all <laughs> or, or what, um, but that's actually an accreditation standard for us now in PA programs is to teach our students that. And so I think that's really beneficial to the students to understand what other professions do and before they get out into working into clinical experience. And so I'm very happy that that has been something that has brought into our curriculum much more uh, robustly than it was in my own. Um, and then maybe if one, one student wants to answer um, and then we can hopefully get to the last question. Seems like they all loved everything. So I guess I can't, <laughs> anybody wanna pop up or? My, my, to me, the worst part was what I deemed the waiting and praying game of applying. Um, and, and that's really what I did. I wait, I waited and I prayed. And also I lit a lot, a lot of candles at church, but you know, whatever you do. <laughs> um, so that was like the, the, just the very, I mean, you guys know, especially if you're reapplying, it's very stressful. It's very stressful waiting and hoping that somebody will value you or school val value you as much as you value them. But again, I think if you, if you tailor your application to that school, um, you know, they will appreciate you as much as you will appreciate them. Like, you know, when it's the right fit, like you, you will know. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so I think I have one more question here and I hope I don't say this incorrectly. Is it uh, Saima Islam? Uh, it's Saima Islam, but you were very, very close. <laughs> um, so first I wanna say thank you to everybody. I'm so happy that um, you pit held this session. I learned so much and I think I'm just falling in love with your program more. <laughs> Um, I have uh, two questions. Hopefully the first one will be a quick one. Um, so I was curious about uh, PCE hours. I'm currently a nursing student and I've done a bunch of clinical rotations where I've had hands-on patient care under the supervision of a licensed RN. And I was wondering if that would be considered as PCE? Yes. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and then my second question is, um, so I understand that, you know, the past year has been unconventional to say the least. And this is a question, um, I guess, for the students and um, uh, Professor Murphy. Um, how did, I suppose, you pit um, approach any, I guess, distractions from the pandemic? Like, did it affect clinical rotations? And how did you guys sort of overcome that? Sure. Um, and so I, I can speak from my perspective. So it did. It did interrupt uh, clinical rotations quite a bit. Um, all of the students removed were removed from all of their clinical sites. Um, we did um, apply for a um, sort of a, a special permission through our accreditation commission um, to sort of change the way that we did clinical year last year to ensure that our graduates would still or our students would still graduate on time. And um, the plan that we put through our accreditation commission was approved. And so we were able to still um, get the students back into the clinic once the hospital systems were able to open back up from the pandemic um, to keep them safe um, and, and, and to provide all of the PPE and all of those types of things were necessary for to be able to get them back in and we were successful and, and we got them all um, to graduate on time. And so we were really, really proud of that effort and, and really proud of the students for their flexibility in dealing with a lot of that. Um, I, I will open it up to any of the students on the call to maybe answer from your perspective. Maybe we can take one. Um, we have about a minute left, but I know that these students, I think are just, I, I think I haven't seen any clinical year students pop up. I think it's all didactic if I can see correctly. Um, so I'm not sure that how well they'll be able to answer that because they weren't with us last year, they started January. Um, certainly they uh, you know, started in a different way with more virtual and, and then that kind of thing. But uh, maybe one, one of you could speak up if you, if you feel fit. I would just say you wouldn't really have to worry about if there is a virtual in the future. They've handled it really well and they've given us schedules ahead of time. And if there's changes, they make sure to let us know. Um, and I don't think we're deprived of any sort of education. If anything, we're getting more, it feels like. <laughs> 
Um, so that's always a good thing. And, and we know that they can handle that. So if in the future you're ever falling into that or if things ever get worse, just know that they handle it really well and, and you're in good hands at Pitt. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for answering, Kat. I appreciate that. I, and, um, I would like to say something too. If you have an accountability partner through this all for, with a virtual, just to help you make sure you stay on guide, um, that will help you through if you do need to go to virtual. Just have that person say, hey, are you up to here? Or are you up to there? Just to keep you in check. Sometimes that helps. Probably good advice. <laughs> That's very true. Thank you. Well, it looks like we are about a minute over. Um, Nicole, I didn't know if you needed to end anything on the call or? Nope, that is up to you. I'll let you stick around for a minute if you are available. And if not, um, well, that's that's fine too. I dropped the PA pit at shs.pit.u email address in the chat box. Make sure you grab that. It is also available on the website, shs.pit.edu slash PA program. Um, if you have any additional questions, if you need anything at all, please reach out to us. We are more than happy to help you figure it out through this journey. We know that it, it can be complicated. So please reach out with any questions you may have. Thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah, I think we got through all the questions. What a wonderful discussion. Thank you all. Special thanks again to the students. I appreciate you all so much. And I'm so glad to see some of your faces today. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to our um, general admission question uh, email address or through the resources that Nicole provided you. And good luck to you all. I hope to um, maybe see some of your faces soon for interviews or are possibly even getting into our program. So good luck to everyone. Thank you.